This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I like going fishing. I've, uh, I've liked going fishing for a long time. I went fishing when I was a kid with, uh, with my mother and my stepfather and we had, they had a little pond we'd go down to. It was big enough you could put like a rowboat on it kind of thing. We'd fish and we'd catch like crappie and bluegill and that kind of thing. And when I lived in Oregon, I used to go salmon fishing, which was a lot of fun. And you would, you know, you, you know if you've never seen you know, the salmon run, maybe if you've been up north, but um, you know, in my mind, it was like this sort of like, sea of fish kind of moving by and it was really easy to catch that they're actually not that easy to catch at least not in Oregon um, and you have to catch them in the mouth if you accidentally snag one in the tail that doesn't count you gotta throw it in um, but I love going fishing and we have a, a place up north now we have a camp and, and when my son and I like to go fishing there and uh, and it's just a lot of fun but the truth is I'm actually not very good at it I do a lot more fishing than I do catching and so it's really more of a time to sort of meditate on the beauty of nature than it is to like catch fish. Um, and, and, you know, last week I talked about, you know, kind of the difference between people who, who like know something in theory and people who can actually sort of apply it. I think I know in theory what I'm supposed to be doing in fishing, but actually like making it happen, there's some kind of disconnect there. Um, and I've been out with like a fishing guide and most I think I just really frustrated the fishing guide. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, I, I watched not too much, but I, I've seen like on TV, you know, they have like fishing tournaments. This is amazing. I mean, they have like fishing competitions where people like go out in boats and, you know, they're going to, they, they're trying to catch the biggest fish or the most fish of a particular kind of fish. I'm really happy with anything that jumps on the line, but I know, you know, you can like look for a particular kind of fish with a particular bait and, and way of fishing. And, and I watch these guys on TV and I've seen them up in the St. Lawrence and it's really amazing to me. Um, you know, they'll be like, they're throwing a line and they're catching a fish and they're throwing a line to catch a fish. I'm like, oh, that one's no good and just throw it back. And I, I, I've never really had that experience where the fish are just like jumping on the line. And so, so fishing is something that I enjoy. I like going out uh, fishing and uh, it's, a, it's a thrill when you actually catch something, but it's not something that, that uh, is really easy. Like if my family had to depend on me catching fish for food, the way I currently fish would, would currently leave us starving to death. Unless we wanted to eat like seaweed, um, we catch a lot of that, um, especially in Lake Ontario. But, and so when, when Jesus comes up to, to um, Simon and Andrew, he says, follow me, I'll make you fisher of men. That doesn't fill me with a lot of confidence. I gotta be honest, like if Jesus said that to me, I'll make you a, a fisher of people. And I'm like, I don't know, Jesus, I, I'm not really good at fishing. 
right? I mean, I know they're professional fishermen, so they probably know what they're doing, you know, but for the rest of us, this story, I think, can be a little misleading, right? Because when we think about evangelism, about inviting people into faith, about, about asking someone to come and join us, we think it should be like this story where we go like, hey, why don't you come follow Jesus? And everybody's like, yes, I'm going to drop everything I'm doing right now and go do that. Because that's really not how people are. Most people are kind of like those fish I'm trying to catch, totally oblivious and uninterested in whatever bait I'm throwing in front of them. And so I think that for us, as much as it is important for us to be thinking about how can we share the good news with people, you know, this idea of going up and just like throwing the bait in front of someone and hoping that it works is, is clearly not a strategy that for most of us is going to work really well. Now, there may be some of you here who are like expert evangelists. And I know you're all thinking, well, John, shouldn't you be an expert evangelist? Like you went to college for that, but they actually didn't have a class on that. Now, if, if you want to parse some Greek verbs, I got you. But uh, um, the actual practicality, it's surprising to me, the actual practicalities of church are, are not something that's really covered in um, seminary. But that aside, I think all of us have this call to be evangelists, to share the good news, right? I mean, that's at the heart of what the story is about, about all of these stories today is about how do we share this amazing gift that we've been given? How do we let other people into the joy or the strength or the comfort that we have found in faith so that they too can participate, right? Because hopefully all of us have had something positive and life-changing because of our connection to God. And whether that's just because it's great to sit in a community of people who, who accept you for who you are, or it's because you've been able to do something really miraculous and amazing in, in ministry. Or, or even just because you love to come and, and sing the songs um, about God. You know, there's something here, I hope, that is compelling to you. That there is something about being together as people of faith. Unlike being a group of people doing anything else that is meaningful and touches your heart and your soul in some important way. And the, and the trick for us is to figure out how to share that, right? Because, because I'm pretty sure, you know, I see a lot of churches who advertise, um, and they usually advertise things like, you know, um, you're going to go to hell if you don't come to our church. That, that's the standard bait, that's put out there. And I gotta be honest, I just don't find that particularly compelling. And I don't think lots of other people do too, right? And, and I remember some, uh, some colleagues in West Virginia who, whose whole idea of evangelism was getting people to recite a particular prayer. If they would just recite that prayer, that's all that really needed to happen. But that also seems to be missing something. That's sort of like having the fish brush up against your hook and letting it go and counting that as a catch, right? It's, it's not the same. Because what we're really looking for is, is connection and connection within community. That we want people to join the community because there's, there's value in the community. And not just so we can perpetuate our organization, but because there is something of value in that connection to God that we share together. So I, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that Jesus wants more people to follow Jesus. Because, because Jesus knows that if, if we can really align ourselves with his teachings, if we can actually build a life following his example, that the world we live in will be so much better and that all of us will be so much happier. That we will find contentment and purpose and meaning and joy in surrendering our lives to God's will in a way that nothing else can. And I would hope that we would want that for everyone. 
And so the trick for us, I think, is to figure out what that, that thing is within us. That there's no golden marketing strategy. There's no sign we can put up. There's no witty sayings that we can put on the board. You know, no, no bright sign that we can hang that's going to make people come. What will bring people to Jesus is the sharing of our genuine faith. And to talk about the thing that really matters to us about our life of faith. Right? In the same way that we would want to share other things in our lives that we love with others, books, movies, recipes, stories, we can share something about our relationship to God in hopes that other people may connect with that idea as well. And I know for a lot of us, our faith is very personal and kind of private. And yet it's also important for us to, to be in a place where we feel a little vulnerable and sharing that a little bit and be willing to, to be rebuffed. Because, because as much hard as it is to invite someone who says no, I know for sure that no one will come if we never invite anyone. So we have to kind of take that risk because the kingdom of God is built one person at a time, one relationship at a time. That, that Jesus doesn't broadcast his message over the radio in Israel, but he walks through the, the towns and the villages and the cities, and he interacts with people one on one. And, and I think this is the most important part, is that it has to be genuine. We have to be our genuine, true selves. And if our genuine, true selves isn't really aligned with Jesus' example, then we're not really going to attract people. Because, because I think that Jesus remains a compelling figure. And that when we live a life that's like his, the other people find that appealing and want to know what that thing is. I mean, I know that was my experience. Before I came to church, I met people who were genuine, faithful Christians. And, and I got to be honest, they weren't Episcopalians. They, were, they went to other churches. But they lived out a faith in a way that I had never seen before. And I wanted that for myself. And I know that if we do that, then other people will find what we do and who we are to be a compelling invitation. And they'll want what we have. So it's important for all of us to, to cultivate our faith, to model our lives on Jesus, to take up the disciplines of, of worship and prayer and service and study and generosity and Sabbath so that our lives look like the model of Jesus so that other people will see it and that they too can find what we have. It's not our secret. It's not our treasure to hoard. It's this gift that we're asked to continue giving, this thing we call faith. Oh, man.